And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man, rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Thus far the reading of God's word this evening. Now by the time, by, the, by this time in the ministry of Jesus, he has been introduced in the gospel and he has been speaking in synagogues. On Sabbath days, he's been demonstrating the power and the authority that he possesses uh, by, uh, by being fully God and as well as fully man. And that includes his ability as well as his will to heal the sick and to control and to drive away demons and even to exercise authority over the fish of the sea as he did in that powerful demonstration with Peter in chapter 5, which was just previous to this. Now comes a turning point in Jesus' ministry as Luke presents it. Uh, he's prepared himself the night before by praying fervently all night long. This is a big moment. And he ri rose up and he called to himself 12 of, of those followers who were with him and called them apostles. And now Jesus turns his attention rather specifically, although there are others who are listening, to teaching and training those apostles. Now this is the context in which Luke has, been, has recorded these words of Jesus that take up the rest of this chapter in which I want to focus on for three more times during this summer, Deo Valente. Um, Luke's Sermon on the Plain, and, and that nickname comes from the fact that Luke makes the very specific point that he uh, went out and stood on a level place as opposed to on a mount, as it says in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, so this is, is, is called sir, his Sermon on the Plain, and, and, uh, but it doesn't get anywhere near the attention that Jesus' Sermon on the Mount gets in Matthew 5 and through 7. Uh, many, commentar many books and commentaries have been written about the Sermon on the Mount uh, and for, that, uh, for the study of the message that Matthew has. But you know, I don't think I've ever come across a single published commentary or book dedicated to the Sermon on the Plain. Uh, now, I can think of a few reasons for that. One might be because People just assume that Luke's text is a copy, an abbreviated copy at best, of the Sermon on the Mount that we find in Matthew. Uh, and that uh, if we're going to be studying the words of Jesus, let's go to the fuller, richer text that's in Matthew, and, and we'll, we'll just leave uh, Luke's text alone. Another reason might be that Luke's text is not quite as appealing as Matthew's is, Matthew's list of Beatitudes is much longer. Uh, the words sound more spiritual, more comforting, whereas Luke's list of Beatitudes is more brief, more, more earthy. Uh, he gets into words that are even, uh, goes along as even more political. They might even sound harsh by comparison. And so you're not sure exactly what Jesus is getting at or, or talking about. 
And then Luke's Beatitudes are followed by that list of woes, which don't appear in Matthew. And that also can be a little bit disconcerting, uh, a little bit confusing. What's, what's that all about? Matthew's text is generally popular for yet a third reason. Many people will read the Sermon on the Mount, and they will conclude that that is the essence of the gospel. Uh, that it's merely a call to a righteous, generous life, a call to thoughtful, kind, servant-like living. And some will even think that this is the essence of Christianity in its most primitive form. This is the gospel, they will say. Uh, just, it, it is just a philosophy. It's just a way of life that is based on moralism. After all, you know, in neither of those sermons... Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain. Is there anything uh, mentioned about the cross or the blood of Jesus? Anything about the grace, uh, the mercy of God toward a hopeless and fallen world? And because these are the very words of Jesus, the conclusion can often mistakenly be made that the golden rule, which is the essence, if you will, of the message of the Sermon on the Mount, that he was not declaring himself to be the Son of God, uh, that he was not declaring himself to be the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through me. Rather, they think Jesus was only teaching us, he was only after uh, making us better, what we can do in the world better, what we, what we, should, we should be good to our enemies, we should we should not judge other people, and that a man who is good of heart will bring forth the good fruit in his life. And they'll say, isn't that the real message that Jesus meant to give us? And everything else has just been added on by other people, and, and it's, it's, we need to strip it away and get to the real meat of, of the gospel, which is just simply be kind, be generous, be, be a blessing. Let me give you an example of this in modern day life. Every year in December, we see the very same thing. People of all kinds of mindsets and worldviews will all come together to celebrate the holiday of Christmas. Over and over again, we are told and we are retold that the message of Christmas really has nothing to do with God becoming man, but the real meaning and spirit of Christmas is just love, just joy, giving. It's the spirit of giving et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How many, how many uh, smarmy movies do we have to watch that all teach us the same lesson? And that we need to be reminded annually of that because, well, I guess we forget that we need to be good to other people. We, uh, our opportunity is to be kind and loving to our fellow man and even to nature, and that by so doing, we will make our world a better place. Now, those of us who know the true meaning of Christ's birth mourn over that kind of pagan propaganda, for it is, after all, the most hopeless of doctrines. And worse, it takes the glory and the crown that belongs to God and places it square upon the head of man, denying that he is sinful denying that he is condemned, denying that he is lost, and that he has an absolute need for a Savior, and saying instead, man is, after all, basically good, and that the Lord will smile on your kindness when you are good to others. You see, it's just another, it's another chapter in this long, never-ending battle to communicate the real gospel to the world again and again again and again, and again. You know, when fallen man so, you know, so desperately wants to deny that he has any need of that gospel, I don't need this, I don't need Christ, I don't need salvation. It's the battle of whether salvation and hope and life are to be found in man's inner sense of goodness and ability and desire to do right or in your abandoning any such hope in yourself and finding all those things instead in Jesus, 
who came to do for you what you could not, what you would not do for yourself. Now, these two sermons, the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain, are not ever meant to stand alone because of that misunderstanding. We don't pull those words out and say, this is the word of God and nothing else matters. We put it right back into context and we say, what does God, what is Jesus giving us here and what do we really need to draw from it? Now, there are three things by way of introduction. There's three things that these sermons have in common. They're not the same sermon, but they are three things that they have in common that we'll start with. First of all, the messages of Matthew 5 through 7 and Luke 6 Both emphasize the coming of the king. Jesus did not come just to preach the golden rule. Just teaching us to be kind to one another would not have gotten him crucified. He came bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. In Matthew's gospel, that's made very clear by Jesus' pronouncement to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand because the king is at hand. In Luke's gospel, that is portrayed in how Jesus fulfills the purposes of God for man to proclaim liberty to the captive and the oppressed, to announce the acceptable year of the Lord, acceptable, that is, to his plan, his purpose for what we are doing here. Jesus did not simply obey God's law as if he were uh, competing with the Pharisees. He declared himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus was the center of everything, and he made that very clear. Now, the second thing these sermons have in common is both sermons emphasize the radical nature of discipleship. When you read the instructions Jesus uh, gives in both messages, you realize there really is not much here that is warm and comforting. As much as these words are strong marching orders for his disciples. Both messages stress the plain and simple fact that if man was able to do good on his own, well, he's just not very good at it. Rather, doing these things Jesus teaches, especially with any sense of doing them for a purpose that extends beyond our own sense of pride and our own sense of vanity and our own sense of glorifying ourselves, well, that goes against our very nature. That's not what we want to do. Jesus can teach till the cows come home. It won't make any difference in how I act. But Jesus is not appealing to our better sides to our latent goodness and saying what the world needs now is love, sweet love. He is saying the service of following and representing Christ will sometimes be very hard and very difficult and very sacrificing and because we don't want to do it naturally and yet we must do it. We must declare that the glory always goes to God. That's very different, I would suggest to you, than thinking that by doing some daily good deed, I may somehow be contributing to world peace and and gaining points with God. Well, the third thing these sermons have in common is that both sermons emphasize the reality of the heart of sinful man as he faces the true gospel. What was the message of the prophets of old, and why did Israel reject them, even put them to death? Why would we be persecuted by anyone today if all we're trying to do is be good, to do good to to the benefit of others? Well, the answer to that is the true gospel is not just doing something good for someone else. It involves confrontation. It involves identification. I am different than you. The Lord has called me to himself. That's uncomfortable. That's radical. That causes a reaction, teaching us to look instead to him who is altogether righteous and outside of us instead of looking in 
for what we can offer. And that's a message that isn't welcome to the ears of sinful man. He doesn't want this. The gospel is something man does not want. And when you get that kind of reaction, you may be encouraged. I'm getting to the point. So there are many things that are similar about these messages that Jesus preached on these different occasions. But still, the emphases that we're going to be focusing on as we look at at the Sermon on the Plain are the differences between the two. What is it that Luke uniquely brings out in Jesus' message and, and, and that will determine how he presents them to us? I'm sorry our note sheet is just a note full of lists. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. But bear with me. The first difference, I think, here is that the context in Luke tells us that these instructions that Jesus is is specifically giving, as I said, to his apostles, to his followers. There's even a sense of mission to the instructions that he gives in Luke. You know, there's four places where the list of apostles is found in where they are given to us by name. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts. And by placing the calling and listing of the apostles here, as we find them in verse 12 through 16, just before we started reading, Luke is reminding us that this message of Jesus contains the training instructions that Jesus gave to them as to how he wants his people to act, what he wants his people to teach, and how he wants the gospel to be displayed as they themselves live and present that gospel to the world. This is the modus operandi for the gospel. It's not the gospel. It's how you regard, you demonstrate the change in yourself, how you act in a way that they will be caught off guard by. By placing that list there, Luke is reminding us that the message of Jesus contains those training instructions. And as many, with many things that the scripture reminds us of, the words of the gospel call us to examine and convict ourselves first. If we're acting like everybody else in the world without what we say, then we're not different at all. We have to be different. It starts, it doesn't end, but it starts with the instructions that he gives us in these sermons. And also as we strive to live before the world, not just as examples, but as servants, We need the support and the encouragement of those that we count and we lean on, one another, brothers and sisters in the Lord. We need to lean on you, those of like faith, like practice, like commitment. We need them to be mutual team players, fellow servants. A second difference is that Luke teaches us here to trust in Jesus as a person, not a cause, not a purpose, not a a methodology or a philosophy, but a person. Even as we trust in his word, we are to trust in him. Probably the clearest way to recognize that this is not merely a lecture on ethics is when Jesus reminds us throughout that he is not only involved in the process, he is involved in the outcome. Why should we try to love our enemies? Is it just to stop war, uh, stop fighting, because uh, we want to teach and show the world that we ourselves have, uh, have the solution for man's betterment, or is it to show that we can love others only because he has first loved us? That's the method out. That's the reason. That's why we're doing this. We're not knocking ourselves out just to, just to make neighbors like us. We're, we're wanting to point them to Christ. I'm different because Christ has called me. He may call you. It'll make you different too. Our lives are to reflect his love for us. We are to be merciful to others because our Father in heaven is also merciful to us. That's what we bring to others. We bring Christ. We bring Christ. We bring the person. We bring the gospel. A third difference is that Luke teaches us here that we must long to be righteous. 
Long to follow Jesus. Long to be in his image. You know, the call to holy life should not be a strange one to us or even one that we only grudgingly accept. I have to do this because otherwise I am not a good Christian. It should be the very delight of our hearts to want to be like Jesus, to as a sign of the work of the Holy Spirit in me, a sign of the new life that Jesus has given to me that is buried within and that would, should be the most foremost goal in everything we do is to represent Jesus. Does, does that mean that if we struggle with sin and selfishness, if we fall back like David in Psalm 6 did, and that, uh, that it, does it show us that, that we really uh, are not Christians after all? Well, of course not. The struggle itself indicates new life, whereas once you reveled in those things, you enjoyed them, you didn't see any problem with them, now you understand those things as your enemies. Those words that you once used, they're your enemies. They're not your friends. They're not your tools anymore. They're things that are knocking you down, things that are corroding your own spirit. You want to be rid of them. You want to get rid of them. You want to de deny yourself those things because you want to be like Christ. But it also means the struggle must not just be a moral one. You aren't just making yourself a good person. Being good, doing good just out of guilt or out of pride, to be seen by men or out of self-satisfaction, none of that's going to impress the Lord. We should not be concerned, you know, to just satisfy and improve ourselves and the world or even to gain the praise and the reward or the acknowledgement of others. Instead, we must believe what God says, that all of the self-serving things that we once depended on and counted on are indeed filthy rags in his sight. The struggle to be holy must be just that, to know that we are called of Christ to be separate from the world, and yet to call the world to be separate with us, to be committed to deny themselves their own worldly praise and attention, to pick up the humility of the witness and the word of Jesus, as well as the cross and its shame, and to follow Jesus and bring him into my world. If you do that, not only will you be blessed, not only will you be happy, that's what the word means, but Jesus will be magnified. And it is that way, most specifically, that Jesus will succeed in drawing all men to himself. Pray with me.